In the beginning, darkness was on the face of the earth. And God said, let there be light. And God created creatures of every kind. But humanity has exploited his creation in the name of the almighty dollar. Until today, thousands of species are on the brink of extinction. But there are those who are acting to save endangered species before it's too late. off the northwest coast of Australia. It's a special place, a magic place where humpbacks play. It is one of the last places left on the face of the earth where these magnificent creatures are not troubled by humanity. Because of this, for millennium, it's been a place where mothers have come to give birth. to teach their newborn about the mysteries and dangers of their new world. But it's not only the humpback's nursery, it's also their boudoir. It's where they come to mate. It's a place where the males battle each other for the affections of the female. Deep below the murky waves sing songs of love. That is why this location is a closely guarded secret, known only to a small group of people, including the scientists who live on the whale song, the research vessel of the Australian Centre for Whale Research. Kurt and Mitch Jenner have been studying the humpbacks for more than 10 years. Two years ago, they were joined by their daughter, Micah. And that's called a pickerel fin slack. It was the Jenners who discovered this special place. Since then, every year, they have followed the whale's migratory path. Known as the Humpback Highway, the whales beat a path from the frozen Antarctic feeding grounds along the West Australian coast. Until months later, they reach the tropical calving grounds of the Kimberley. It's the same path the whalers of old used to follow as they reaped their harvest of death on these magnificent creatures. Before the whalers' harpoons struck fear into the hearts of the humpback, these waters were home to close to 17,000 whales. When the last lance was fired, 97% of the population had been destroyed. It would have been like the whole of humanity except for Indonesia being wiped out. 
the Holocaust in anyone's language. Their suffering ended in the mid-1960s, when at last the humpback was placed on the endangered list. Today, their number is on the increase. The Jenners estimate that there are now around 5,000 humpbacks living in the Indian Ocean. Part of the Jenners' research is monitoring the humpback's recovery. They do this by observing individual whales. Each whale has distinctive markings on its tail, its body, and in the shape of its dorsal fin. The Jenners photograph these and then compare them with previous years. This enables them to log the whale's movements. These markings are as individual as our fingerprints. Their task is huge, but they receive help from Earthwatch volunteers who come from all over the world. That's from the peduncles, from the dorsal down to the tail flukes. These people are not scientists, but accountants, computer programmers, even grandmothers. Well, we've got a pretty wide uh, variety of tasks for the volunteers to tackle while we're, while we're out here. It's uh, probably a bit of a challenge for them to come to grips with them all, especially in the first few days. It's a bit like information overload. For the next few weeks, the Earthwatch volunteers will spend up to 12 hours a day following these humpbacks, helping to identify them and logging their every move. Katie McCabe, the Jenner's research assistant, explains one of the more exciting points of whale research. Which is when it just shoots out of the water and the you'll really notice it. Yeah, it's yeah, so a huge mm -hmm. splash. You can have a half breach or a full body breach, but it will be quite obvious. Each time we see a whale, it's exciting. I think for me, it's exciting because I think it's a it's a 16 metre animal that's uh, 40 tonnes and every now and then they turn around and take a look at you and when they look at you, you, you become their, their study object I guess and, and you're not really supposed to influence your study objects like that but I really enjoy that. When they get curious about you, when they get curious about the boat and swim around and have a look up at you and check you out, uh, I, I really enjoy that and everyone does. That's what we call as a whale fix. Nish says the volunteers are in for the thrill of a lifetime and a lot of hard work. What's happening is the whales are all moving through this area, migrating up the coast, and they're heading for this area here. And that's the, probably the number one uh, goal of, I guess, the migratory herds are aiming for that calving area. It will be two days before the volunteers reach the calving grounds, but they get to see their first whales long before then. moment it's one adult but we'll wait on the pod comp until we get a bit closer. Uh, did you manage to get a bearing for that? Which direction was About it? About out here. And while the volunteers hone their whale watching skills, Kurt and Mish spend time with Micah. There'll be little time for play once they reach the carving grounds. things that we're hoping to see uh, in this area is a lot of pregnant cows. Uh, this is the time when the cows will be just starting to enter the area and begin to be looking at giving birth. So there's a, a remote chance that for the first time we might actually be able to witness a humpback whale giving birth. So that'll be quite exciting. Although the exact location of the carving grounds is a secret, we can say they are close to the Buccaneer Archipelago. It's pristine, nature at its best. And because of this, it's the ideal place to study the humpback's natural behavior. Nowhere else in the world is there a calving ground that's not closely associated with some tourist activity. If you think about Hawaii, you think about the Bahamas, um, anywhere else in the world that you have humpback whales that are readily accessible, 
um, to study, they're also readily accessible to the tourist industry. So you can't really say that they're not impacted or biased by, by humans. Up here, there's literally nothing out here. While whale song is anchored in the safety of a bay, the research is carried out from a small 19-foot fiberglass boat called Mega, after the humpback's Latin name. It's from this tiny craft that we get to meet the whales close up and maybe see a berth, which is something that has rarely, if ever, been witnessed. But it is known that when a pregnant cow is in labor, she generally has an escort or midwife with her. With the amount of blood in the water during birth, predators like sharks and crocodiles would soon make a meal of a newborn baby humpback. Sharks and crocodiles infest these waters. The Jenners believe the midwife's job is to break the umbilical cord, freeing the calf, then to take the afterbirth and lure any predators away from the mother and calf. This 5.5 meter shark is feeding on a bull sea lion. He could as easily be a baby whale. So when a pod of two humpbacks is sighted resting on the surface, expectations are high. What you can try and do maybe is get in front of them. But it's not a pregnant female and her midwife. It's a male and female pod. So instead of observing a whale in labor, the researchers are about to witness some playful courtship. This is unique. After 10 years of studying whales, the Jenners have never seen courtship like this. Two huge 40-ton whales playing gently in the sea. Mitch believes the whales have found the feel of the seaweed quite sensual. They'd spent the morning with this pod, and it was now time to move on to find another. Because one of the whales is pregnant, cautiously they keep their distance. Scar, one has a lot of scars on it. Yeah, totally chopped up. It's got scars all over it. Have another look at her. 
exactly see how wide she is. The two whales are restless. This makes Mish believe the pregnant one is due to calf. But the sun is getting low, and Kurt is pessimistic about seeing the bird. The whales dive. It will be dark soon, so the researchers are forced to head back to whale song. Maybe tomorrow we might see her with a calf. Most of the calves are probably born at night. Nobody's ever seen a birth, so that's probably why. Maybe Kurt is right. Maybe the calf will be born tonight. And maybe tomorrow they will see it. With the new day comes another opportunity to get to know the humpback whales. To their delight, the first thing they spot is a mother and calf. Could it be the same whale as last night with her newborn baby? After a closer inspection, the answer is no. The calf's dorsal fin is folded over in the cow's womb before it's born. And if this one had been born last night, it would still be that way. Oh, this is uh, one of the first cow-calf uh, pairs that we've seen for the season so far, and uh, the calf looks like it's probably about two weeks old at least. Uh, it's in pretty good shape. Dorsal fin has just stood up. We can still see the fetal fold crease in the side of its dorsal fin, but uh, that indicates it's at least a week old, and judging from its downtime, it's probably a bit older, maybe around two weeks. Through the murky Kimberley water, we see that in fact the calf has a scar on its dorsal fin. As for the mother, she is huge, even for a humpback. So the two, for the record, are named. Big Mama and Scarfin. We'll be just in training with the calf here. The calf's circling around and chasing her up and down and learning how to swim and follow her. A very important lesson for the calf, because in just a matter of weeks, he faces a 3,000-mile journey back towards the Antarctic. Yeah, go ahead, Mish. How are you going out there? Yeah, we're going good. We've got a cow-calf pod at the moment. The Jenners take it in turns to go out on Mega. How old is the calf? Yep, just a young calf. A little bit over a week. Uh, you can still see the crease, but it's not bent over at all. Today, Mish has stayed behind to be with Micah and to catch up on some data entry. Okay, slow down a bit. The researchers nudge closer, and Scarfin is now resting on his mother's nose. Suddenly, Big Mama and Scarfin dive. At first, Kurt thinks it may have been a shark that spooked them, but fortunately, it wasn't. It was Big Mama starting Scarfin's second lesson for the day. And she's teaching him how to slap the pectoral fin. But it seems Scarfin has trouble distinguishing between his peck fin and his fluke. Or perhaps not. Maybe he's just having some fun. For more than an hour, the researchers stay with Big Mama and Scarfin, logging their behavior and identifying areas within the carving ground that appears to be particularly important to the pair. But Scarfin tires, and it's time for his lunch. He dives down to suckle his mother. The researchers spend another five hours on the water, but not a single whale is seen. They had disappeared. The researchers returned to whale song somewhat disappointed, but it was made up for by the welcome they received from little Micah.
That night, while many of them slept, there was a treat for those who didn't. A huge male swam close to whale song and sang an eerie but beautiful song, which cast a spell over the moonlit bay. By morning, he was gone. Today is going to be a special day for the Jenners and the Earthwatch volunteers. They are going to see something that is rarely seen. The day starts well and keeps on getting better. As soon as they are out on the ocean, then they spot the two friends they made yesterday. It's Big Mama and Scarfin. And Scarfin has learned his lessons well. Already he has mastered his fluke movements and is splashing around with much more control than he had 24 hours ago. But today's lesson is breaching. But it's not as easy as it looks. So Mum shows him again. Gradually, Scarfin masters it. He's a quick learner. Then, a real thrill. A double breach from mother and son. Lesson's over, and after all that exercise, Big Mama and Scarfin take a rest. The Jenners take the opportunity to lower the hydrophone to see if there are any singers around. They are curious to see if last night's singer is still about. What they hear is awesome. There are at least two mature males singing close by. As well as being a pre and postnatal delivery area and nursery for the likes of Scarfin, these waters are also mating grounds. At first, it's thought that the males were singing love songs. But it turns out they were more like battle anthems. Big Mama is also aware of the newcomers. A group of marauding males intent on a sexual encounter pose a serious threat to her calf. Suddenly, she and Scarfin dive and are not seen again that day. Out of the blue, three whales come upon the researchers. Oblivious of them, the whales power past them, heading towards the bay. The Jenners immediately recognised the scenario. A single female being chased by two males. The female is the one with the white flank and tall wobbling dorsal fin. Then two more whales appear from nowhere. They are both full-grown bulls. It seems this female is particularly attractive. Four males are now battling it out over her. Suddenly, 80 tons of whales smash into one another as two of them collide. It becomes even more chaotic as, incredibly, another three whales race to join the battle. All of them are males. The volunteers are stunned. Never before have they seen anything like this. 
the Jenners too are awestruck. Rarely in their 10 years of whale research have they seen such combat. A megapod, eight 50 feet, 40 ton whales tearing around this small bay. Although this isn't mortal combat or anything like it, these whales can inflict serious injury on each other. Each of these 40-ton leviathans has razor-sharp barnacles going on, and more than one will leave this fight with serious lacerations. Another sign of battle, an underwater blow. These bubbles are a sure sign of aggression, but the Jenners believe they have another purpose that the bull is trying to hide himself or the female from his competitors by screening them behind a shimmering curtain of bubbles. The battle has been going on for an hour and shows no sign of letting up. Being in the middle of a whale war is not the safest place. The chances of colliding with one of these 40-ton monsters is real. These two missed the research boat by inches. This one is heading straight for the boat. He does an underwater U-turn. Turning on a coin, he amazingly swivels his body to travel in the opposite direction. Another whale isn't quite as quick and just clips the boat, sending out cannon and flying. The battle continues for another half an hour. By then, some of the whales are tired. The battle is waning. Three retreat. Then, another two turn tail. There are now just two males left in the fray. Eventually, one drops out, leaving the original escort the victor. As the sun sets, this whale must act quickly if he is to enjoy the spoils of war. The others will be back to challenge him within hours. That evening back on Whale Song, the researchers had much work to do sorting out the chaos of the day's events. Because we saw that primary escort several times yesterday, so we'll be able to tell. And that was a really distinctive mark. Yeah, and you know that this guy here, who is the primary escort, that really large one, we saw him this morning with a with totally different one. whale. That's totally another whale. Mm. Mm. So that, that just shows the really fluid dynamics of their social organisation, is that they're just moving from pod to pod all the time, which is so different from mm. orca or killer whales, where they stay together in their family units. It's amazing. There's little point spending the day following whales if the information gathered isn't recorded properly. The genus hope for this trip was to identify areas in which cows prepare to give birth. A bonus would be to witness a birth. Their research takes them all over the carving grounds. As they continue their observations, they see some amazing behavior. So nine and 10, the nine, 10, FL hook. And watch for flukes, here comes hook on the left. Here we go. Hey, it's all black. 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 They look almost like um, some kind of a rake mark. The white spots actually look like a maybe. Uh, this one? Despite many sightings, so far, a birth has eluded them. And the carving season is almost at an end. 
Many of the whales have begun their long journey south. And it's time for the Jenners to do the same. It's on the journey south that they come closest to seeing a birth, and in fact, writing a major new chapter in humpback whale research. It is a hot day, one of the hottest. The waters are calm and flat. A strange sight is seen. A single whale fluke floating on the surface, as if discarded by its owner. The Jenners have seen this type of behavior before. They know instantly it is an expectant cow. Their expectations are high. Can you get a down time or actually an up time for me, please, Mike? Okay, started that now. Thank you. Quite a bit of muscle control to hold herself like that, yeah. Yeah. inverted yeah. in that way. Incredible. The way she turns all, however many tons of her, just so gracefully. You know, it's just she doesn't hardly splash at all. You know, completely inverted, and no. the flukes come over. That's right. She just down. And Slowly, the big cow surfaces, almost as if wanting sympathy. She makes her way towards whale song. Then, another blow. It's her escort. After a while, the two dive again. Once again, hanging by her tail. This is a female that is possibly going to give birth uh, maybe tonight. They don't seem to give birth during the daytime. It might be that the uh, hormone levels are lower at night and that seems to be most mammalian births are at night. But she's uh, very close in that she's really large and round and obviously it's, uh, this is some sort of comfort factor is the way that she's lying at the surface like this. Then suddenly an amazing sound. On board the boat, we hear singing. Accepted wisdom has it that only males sing. Worldwide studies show that escorts are females who act as midwives. So what was happening here? Either this escort is a singing female, which is extremely rare, if not unheard of, or even more interesting, the midwife is a male. A male with selfish desires. In exchange for helping with the birth, he will be wanting to mate with the female as soon as she has delivered. In all of God's creation, an incident like this has never been documented before. This will potentially rewrite the textbooks. Then, for some unknown reason, the singing stops and the expectant whale and the midwife decide to leave. It was the whale's decision to go and the Jenner's decision not to follow them. The whales had decided they wanted to be alone and that decision was respected. This left the Jenners with a puzzle. They never managed to determine the sex of the singing whale. So with this secret still untold, they headed south. But it's not over yet. They can compare the photos they took of the singer 
with their catalogue of previous photographs in case it's there. If that fails, who knows? Their path may cross again one day. Once the Jenners have finished working with the Earthwatch volunteers, Mission Kurt will move on to the season's final stage of research. They will meet up with a scientist from Curtin University who will be conducting seismic experiments to see how the whales react. Almost as a precursor to that, as whale song sailed by Cockatoo Island, the boat mysteriously started to shudder and the islands around them erupted into pillars of dust. It was an earthquake, Australia's second biggest, measuring 6.2 on the Richter scale. The whales have now moved out of the calving and mating ground and are on their way back towards their summer feeding grounds. Back to where for the next six months they will gorge themselves on krill. It will have been many months since cows like Big Mama will have had a good feed. These stretch marks show they will have used up much of their stored resources in their blubber when making the journey to the calving grounds, then feeding and nurturing their young ones. The bulls, too, will be feeling more than a little peckish. Now the whales seem to be of one mind, to make the journey south as quickly as possible. But it's a long, hard journey. And as much as Big Mama and the other mothers may want to race south, they have to pace themselves. Otherwise, the young ones won't be able to keep up. But all the lessons learned back in the Kimberley have paid off. The calves keep close to mother, using her slipstream to pull themselves along. But the calves will need a rest soon. After travelling non-stop for several days and nights, the whales reach the Gulf of Exmouth, where the humpbacks will take time out. It's in the Gulf that the whales will be the subject of a series of scientific experiments. Like many marine environments around the world, this part of the Indian Ocean off Western Australia is a treasure trove of natural resources, which means the whales have to coexist with, amongst others, the oil and gas industry. The oil industry operates, by and largely, in a fairly benign way for the whales. The only thing that uh, could possibly bother them, and we weren't sure exactly to what extent it would bother them, is the actual uh, sampling the bottom to find out where the oil reserves are. The exploration for oil and gas is carried out by ships which tow seismic testing equipment, which set off explosive air charges underwater. The noise, which is repeated every 10 seconds, is equivalent to the loudest noise a humpback can make. And the Jenners are concerned this could impact on the great whales. So, in 1996, the Petroleum Exploration Production Association commissioned scientist Rob McCauley of Curtin University to conduct a three-year study into the effects of seismic surveying on marine life. Uh, my field of expertise is underwater acoustics, biological underwater acoustics, and I, I can't do everything, so I get what I consider the best people with the information on the animal, the biological information. And the best people in this case are the Jennies. And Macaulay commissioned the Centre for Whale Research to help him carry out his study. The Jennies' biggest fear is that the noise created by the exploration could disrupt the whale's communications. As we know, this communication is through the whale's songs. The Jennies believe that these songs have many purposes. One song is for attracting a mate. Another may be, as we saw, to soothe the pain or discomfort of another whale. Oh, 
Another song is for navigation, as a direction beacon to show the way along the humpback highway to the rest of the migrating colony. So with this in mind, the experiments are aimed at observing the whale's reaction to underwater noise. This is done by the underwater discharge of compressed air, similar in intensity to that used by exploration ships surveying the ocean floor. The whale song's job is first to locate a pod of whales. Can we go a little bit more to starboard, starboard please? Then for an hour they log every movement of the pod. Every minute detail is recorded. Once they have established a pattern of normal behaviour for the pod, Macaulay will begin his experiments. Very good. The air gun is lowered overboard and the experiments begin. The underwater acoustic expert follows the same course as the whales, imitating survey ships, dragging the air gun behind his boat. They maintain a parallel course with the whales. There are strict regulations to protect the whales from harassment. The scientists are not allowed to get close to them, to intercept them, or to herd them in any way. Every 15 seconds for around two hours, Macaulay discharges his underwater gun. Researchers on whale song continue to log. Blow cow. Every change in the animal's behaviour. The physical effects of the discharge can only be felt close by the air gun, but the noise can travel over hundreds of kilometres in the shallow waters of the Exmouth Gulf. So what we've been able to do is find in the last two years that whales do have a reaction and it seems to be within about a kilometre to a kilometre and a half the whales will definitely uh, react and either swim away from the sound of the gun or move into a, a, you know, a shallower area where the sound isn't as intense. Although the early results appear to indicate that the effects on the humpbacks are minimal, still more research needs to be carried out. While the oil and gas industry is seen by some as a threat to these animals, so too are other maritime industries. Each spring, the prawn trawlers harvest millions of dollars of prawns from these waters. Well, prawn trawling's got to be probably the single most destructive method of fishing uh, that we're using uh, right now in coastal waters. They're really like a bulldozer roaring along the bottom, just clear felling everything in, the, in their path. They're, they're very destructive. Macaulay agrees and likens prawn trawlers' activities to the devastation caused by clear felling rainforests. There should be significant areas set aside where trawlers can't go, so we maintain the, the habitats that were there before. But both scientists agree that, except for noise, prawn trawlers like the oil industry appear to pose no direct threat to the humpbacks, except perhaps if a boat and a whale were to collide, which happens rarely. 
The two men also agree that the biggest threat to the whales comes from a totally different area, one which seems benign but is far from it. Ironically, it's from the one group of people whose last wish is to harm the humpbacks. It's the whale watchers, tourists who just want to commune with the giants of the deep. People uh, whale watching can be a problem uh, if they overstep the mark, and that mark's very difficult to define. Doug Cochran is the wildlife officer in charge of policing whale watching. He says, like most populated areas close to the whales' migratory paths, our fascination for the whales draws us like magnets. The Humpback Highway is an annual um, track from the kitchen in Antarctica to the bedroom in the warm waters of our Norwest. That puts those animals very close to the coast and very close to the reach of um, human activity. And it's important that we understand that when you have a population uh, recovering from near extinction. Doug says at the moment whale watching is well under control. But as the whale's population continues to grow, as the humpbacks claw themselves back from extinction, the genosphere that, away from the main patrol areas, tourists could put pregnant and nursing cows under stress, especially in the Exmouth Gulf. Mostly what we use to uh, key in on this uh, behavior is the cow-calf pods because they would be the most sensitive members of the community and uh, obviously they're also the next generation of whales coming along if, you're, if these whales are being bothered and, and driven out of an area that may be a warm water sanctuary for them, then, um, then that's a problem. This current generation of parenting whales is the progeny of the most important generation of West Australian humpback whales. They are, in fact, the grandchildren of the whales who survived the whaling holocaust. Put another way, it's this generation of whales which are the offspring of the humpback baby boomers. This generation which is being born today will take this community's numbers in the next ten years to more than treble its current population, to top the numbers of the pre-whaling days, which means for the first time in a century there will be more humpback whales in these waters than there were before humanity sailed these oceans with harpoons and flaying knives. Because of this, the Jenners are now calling on the Kimberley Carving Grounds and the Exmouth Gulf to be declared a humpback reserve. What we need to do at this stage of the game before the whales become threatened or pushed out of their uh, sensitive habitats is set up a couple of sanctuaries, probably up in the Kimberley region where they bear their calves, and here in the Exmouth Gulf area where they stop and rest again with their calves on the way south would be two good starting points. Reserving areas, important areas that have been identified for calving, is good sense, in as much as if you disturb that nursery area then you can seriously affect the survivorship of the species. But will the authorities heed the warnings in time? Will they act before it's too late? By now, most of the humpbacks have left the Gulf well rested and are heading south, leaving these waters to the many other inhabitants who live here. Time also for the Jenners to join them again. But before they leave, they take just one more look around. They see few whales. The wind is blowing from the south and those whales they do see are single-minded, heading into the wind, following the humpback highway back to the frozen Antarctic. Then, on a particularly gentle afternoon, they come across a cow-calf pod. 
it's really interesting to watch the behavior of cows and calves. Sometimes a cow is very protective of her calf and it's purely really, we think, personality probably on behalf of the cow, but also probably depending on the age of the calf. And often they will really protect their, their calves and so they will uh, not allow you to look at them very much or it's hard for us to take photos. So in that situation, we let them go and, and we go without the information that we, we require. But that's not the case here. This mother and calf turn out to be old friends. It's Big Mama and Scarfin. Almost as if they recognize the Jenna's boat, immediately Scarfin is up to his old tricks. In other situations, you'll see a cow and calf, and the cow will be totally at ease with her calf, maybe because it's older, maybe it's just her personality type. That's and really interesting to watch because also, sometimes in those situations, they're totally interested in each other, that they're not really worried about, uh, say, a boat coming to see what's going on. On this occasion, Big Mama lets Scarfin have his own way, confident that he is quite safe. He enjoys himself so much, he gives the boat a playful whack with his tail. But summer is nearly here. The waters are heating up and finally Big Mama calls it a day. She decides it's time to make waves, to join the other humpbacks on their journey back to colder waters. It's time to head back along the humpback highway for Scarfin's first visit to the kitchen so he can fatten himself up so that come the winter he will be strong enough for the return journey to the Kimberley to continue his education, to follow the whale song back to the carving grounds and to one day mate, and so carry on the next generation of Western Australian humpback whales.